So, uh, you know, yeah, I like to start with a little bit of humor. I've always wondered why, I mean, if it was German shepherds, they might have a chance, right? But German Dachshunds, I thought that was kind of, that's kind of funny. That's kind of cute. Um, here's another one I came across, right? Isn't that cute? Aww. Who doesn't, who doesn't go aww when they see that? Come on, man. If you don't go aww when you see that, there's something wrong with your heart. I'm sorry. It's hard. You need to listen to what we're saying. You soften that heart a little bit. And then this one, this is the long looked for picture, a rare photograph of my parents on their way to school. <laughs> Love that. I don't know about you, Steve, but I actually did have to walk to school in the snow uphill. Just one way, however. It was downhill on the way home, but it was one way uh, to school in Montana. So we are wrapping up our sermon series, Faith, Why It Matters. I don't know about you, but I, I've enjoyed preaching and hearing this uh, series because it's been great to be reminded that our faith, just like we were talking about the kids, even though it's something we can't see, it really does matter in our lives. Right? It helps bring us strength, helps us remember that we're never alone, helps us deal with difficult times. So many things that faith brings into our lives. And today we're going to wrap up with our All Saints Sunday by talking about how faith really helps us with our goodbyes. And I think that is an important thing to remember. And we're going to say a little bit more about that. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Lord, as we get ready to spend some time with you and with your word, I just pray that you would help us remember how important your word is for our lives. We need it. We need it to instruct us how to better live, how to better love, how to stay close to you. And so it's a gift. And like with any gift, it won't do us any good if we don't open it. So help us to open your word. And the best way to do this is by opening up our hearts and our minds to figure out what it means for our lives, where we are in this particular phase of our faith journey. Give us something from your word that is going to strengthen us in faith, that is going to renew us in our lives. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's... Does anybody know who that is? John Glenn. Man, you know Mr. Mr. Air Force pilot right there. Absolutely. I thought, it's funny... I, the last service they got it right too. I thought I put that one up there because people wouldn't know and I thought it would have to be this one. Uh, people knew John Glenn, just a, kind of an American legend, if you will. He, he flew, believe it or not, 59 missions in World War II and then later flew 90 missions in the Korean War. He knows how to fly fast. He was the first pilot to average a supersonic speed on a sub, I'm sorry, on a transcontinental flight. He knows how to fly in outer space. In 1962, he became the first American to orbit the Earth. He also knows how to win elections. I didn't know this about John Glenn. He was a United States senator from 74 to 99. He gave speeches, leads committees, inspires audiences, writes books. And yet, for all that he's been able to do and, and, and accomplish, one thing he's never been good at, saying goodbye. Um, it's always been a lifelong struggle. He never learned to tell his wife goodbye. The two met when they were very, very young. They grew up together in New Concord, Ohio. And even though John went on to, a, you know, a national acclaim and just achieve all those things, he will tell you that the true hero of the family is the girl he married in 1943, Annie. See, Annie suffered from severe stuttering. 85% of her efforts to speak fell short. She wasn't able to buy groceries. She just wasn't able to talk on the phone, order food in a restaurant. She really didn't like to go out and go shopping. Remember, they didn't have online shopping in those days because if she ever had to ask a question or if somebody tried to engage her in conversation, she was out, um, she would stumble over her words and get nervous. And the more nervous or sad or emotional she became, the harder it was for her to get the words out. Hence the difficulty with goodbyes. Very emotional time. And so they weren't really able, she couldn't ever get the words out. So they had a little code that they came up with. Each time he was deployed on a mission or called to travel, he would look at Annie and say, hey, I'm going down to the corner store to get a pack of gum. And she would say, don't be long. And off he would go to Japan or Korea or outer space. Now, it's just like with our current president, she worked at this stuttering thing, right? And she got better at it. She, she, learned to, she learned to enunciate. She worked hard at being able to get her words out and say and talk in a much better way. So eventually she was able to 
be able to communicate a little bit later on in her life, but goodbye was something that she was never able to do. And even in 1998, when Senator Glenn became the oldest astronaut, astronaut in history as he was assigned to the shuttle Discovery, upon departure, he told his wife, I'm just going to go down to the corner store to get a pack of gum. And then he handed her a pack of gum. And she put it in a pocket close to her heart and said, don't be long. And off he went into space. One of the hardest things, not only for an astronaut, but for all of people to say, is goodbye. I think it's one of the hardest phrases in the human language. It's not just hard for an astronaut. It's hard for a mom or a dad dropping their child off at school for the first time. Right? Maybe the father of a bride walking his daughter down the aisle. A husband who might have to move into an extended care facility because of declining health, or a wife at a funeral home, especially for her. Because isn't death the most difficult goodbye of them all? And I don't say these words flippantly. I've been pastor at Good Samaritan for almost 20 years. It's a long time. Can't believe you guys have put up with me that long. And in those 20 years, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you can't believe it either. I'm So glad you're back. I remember. Next object lesson in my sermon, Steve. You're in it, brother. I remember that. But in those 20 years, I have had to do a lot of funerals. And I have had to say a lot of goodbyes. I have done funerals for young children. I have done funerals for people who have died in tragic accidents. And I have said goodbye to many, many dear friends here of the Good Samaritan family. And it's interesting, after a lot of those services, even though I believe in heaven, and even though I believe in the promises of God, I would find myself sometimes getting just really melancholy or sad or sorrowful. I remember one time, and it was years ago, kind of having a conversation with myself. I was kind of down. It was something we'd done a funeral for somebody I really cared about. And I was just kind of moping around the office, and I remember thinking to myself, you know, Don, get over it. Death is a natural part of life. And I thought to myself, no. No, it isn't. Birth is, breathing is, hugs, relationships, laughing, but death? If you think about the creation story, wasn't God's original creation without death? And then sin came in and broke the original plan and death entered in. God's original plan did, include, did not include farewells. And that's why I think death is always so uncomfortable. Even for people of great faith, death is hard. Goodbyes are hard. If you want, take out your sermon outline because it's really the first point. is a very simple one. And it's simply this. Goodbye is one of the most difficult words to say. It's challenging. And for anyone who has experienced loss of a loved one, you know how hard that can be. You know how hard it is to, to deal with that while the rest of the world moves on. You're still stuck grieving that person who has passed. Right? When you find yourself picking up the phone to call them and then have to remember before you dial the number. I remember when my parents passed, um, we were finishing up the estate after my, my mom went first at 67 and my dad passed a few years later when he was 70. And uh, we were finishing up the estate, my brother and I. I remember walking in the house and I had met some old friends from high school uh, downtown, and I remember walking in and not, just couldn't wait to tell my dad about how I'd run into Tony and Jim, and I walked in the door, and I literally almost shouted out, and I had to remember, oh, I don't get to do that anymore. Right? For any of you who have experienced something like that, I want you to listen to these promises that God has for us. Please take heart and listen carefully. God has served notice to all of us that farewells are on the clock. They are not final, but rather as a parent says farewell to their child at school while they're dropping them off, knowing that they're gonna see them again in just a few short hours, even the farewells of death are only temporary. From our lesson today, you heard it read, and so I kind of shortened it here for a little bit for your bulletin, because we didn't have room for the whole thing, but it would be great if you'd go and read all of Thessalonians 4. It's just a wonderful verse in God's word. 
It says, regarding the question, friends, that has come up about what happens to those already dead and buried. See, even back then, after Jesus had passed and risen from the grave, they were still asking that question. They still wanted to know more. He said, we don't want you in the dark any longer. First off, you must not carry, I lost my place, you must carry on over them like people who have no hope, as if the grave were the last word. Since Jesus died and broke loose from the grave, look at this, God will most certainly bring back to life those who died in Jesus. Jesus himself will give the command. He will come down from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise. And I love, this is, this is a message translation, which is more of a paraphrase translation instead of a word for word translation, but I love the way he describes this. Oh, we'll be walking on air. And then there will be one huge family reunion with the master. So reassure one another with these words. And I hope you hear those words from Paul to the Thessalonians and to us. This is no small promise. Right? This is a promise that the final goodbye, the most difficult goodbye of them all, is only temporary. And it's hard. We have to be reminded of this because even those of us that have a lot of faith, we still have those kernels of doubt, don't we? I mean, we've never been there. So even people that are 99% sure aren't 100% sure. So this is my, my role is to remind us again and again and again that God's promise in his word is that goodbye, even the goodbye of death is only temporary. And that's that next thing, and I hope that you'll write that in your bulletin because I think it's important for us to do that. God's promise is that the goodbye of death is only temporary. And that there's a Ryu nighting that takes place, a reunion, if you will, with Jesus, the master is the host. And this is a better reunion than most of you've been to. Anybody here ever been to a family reunion? Those things can be crazy, can't they? You know, Uncle Bill, who always drinks too much, Aunt Betty, who, who just, it's like, I don't know what kind of perfume you're using, but don't wear that perfume, Aunt Betty. Right? And then the cousins... Oh my gosh, my, most of my family was in Texas and a lot of them were rural and I, man, the amount of teeth that were missing in our family reunions, goodness. I was quite a catch because I had all of my teeth. <laughs> Sorry, Lorfing family, if you're watching. All right. But this reunion, this reunion is really going to be something special. We don't know a lot about heaven, but, but we get a few glimpses, right? We get a few glimpses of heaven and God's word. A few, just some pictures. And one of the best pictures is from the beloved disciple, John. He's nearing the end of his life. He's quite old at this time, probably in his 80s-ish, right? He's imprisoned on the island of Patmos. He's the writer of Revelations. And he gets this vision from God. And this is what he writes. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. And then look at this. This is my favorite, my favorite part. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. Now that's a reunion. All of these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. I am so looking forward. New body, no more bad back, no more achy knees, no more faulty <laughs> memory, right? No more thinning hair. Right. I know, I know some of you are out there going, I don't have any hair, you just don't complain. I know, I got it, I got it. But look at this, no more death. You know what that means? No more goodbyes. No more sorrow. It's almost like God welcomes us in the reunion and takes, wipes away the tears and says, come on in, you don't need to be sad about things anymore. Right? This is the promise I have for you. This is a place of joy and of peace. And I think maybe the best thing of all a place with no more goodbyes. Right? And this, I love this promise, because we grieve. It, of course we're going to grieve the loss of our loved ones, but we don't have to grieve like the world grieves, like the, the people that have no faith grieve. We grieve 
with hope, with the promise of what is to come. I read a great story about a Christian singer, Stephen Kurtz Chapman. A lot of you might know him. He's a little bit older singer, but especially in the 2010s and the early 2000s, he was very, very popular. And his wife, Mary Beth, in 2008, their five-year-old daughter was killed in an auto accident. Now, Mary Beth survived the accident, but their daughter did pass. And because Stephen Curtis Chapman was an internationally known artist, he was flooded with all kinds of letters and condolences and well wishes and reminders that God was with him. And he said one conversation in particular really kind of gave him strength and gave him a sense of hope. He said, Pastor Greg Laurie, who had also lost his son in an auto accident, told Stephen, remember that your future with Maria is infinitely greater than the past you had with her before the accident. Think about that. Our existence in this world is just such a small portion of our eternal existence. Right? We have this much life, but if I had a rope that stretched all the way to the end of the room, our existence here would be this much of that. If we truly are going to have a reunion with our loved ones, and I'm not exactly sure what that's going to look like, I don't know exactly what our bodies are going to look like. I don't know what those relationships are going to look like, but the Bible tells us we're going to have those relationships. That's going to stretch on longer than we can even imagine. Because death can take a lot. We don't just bury a body, but sometimes we bury the wedding that never happened, the golden years that we never knew. Sometimes we bury the dreams that were yet to be realized or the memories that were yet to be made. Those things are real. And those things are painful. But according to God's word, we have more time with those people when we are reunited with them in heaven. In Acts 3, Luke, I believe, writes these words. He says, Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord, and Jesus, your Messiah, will come again. For Christ must remain in heaven until the time for the final refreshment restoration of all things. Remember that phrase, for the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. And so this kind of reminds me of something, that God's promises of restoration of all things, shouldn't that include relationships? If one of the most important things we have in this world are our relationships, and I truly believe that that is, a relationship with God, a relationship with one another, then if God's going to restore all things, the most important things, one of those would be a relationship. And that's something I look forward to. Some of you might recognize his face, Colton Burpo. I love that last name, Burpo. He was a child of Pastor Todd Burpo and his wife, Sonia. He was only four years old when he had an emergency appendectomy. During the surgery, Colton came very close to death several times. But it was during his recovery over the next several months that Colton's parents discovered just how close to death he had come. When he began to describe some of the things that he had seen while he was being operated on, things that he had, people he had talked to in heaven, even going so far as to meet Jesus. And as he continued to describe details, things like being able to see his parents who were in the waiting room telling them what they were doing while he was in surgery how mom was crying, and how dad was praying. Right? Things that he, there was no way he could have known. People that he had met that he'd never been told of that were a part of his family. At one point, when he was back home, and he was much, much better, he told his mom, you had a baby die in your tummy, didn't you? Parents had never mentioned their miscarriage to their son. Nobody else had either. He was too young to process it. Why would you mention that? And an emotion filled Sonia, his mother's face. She said, who told you that I had a baby die in my tummy? Colton replied, she did, mommy. She said, she died in your tummy. A bit nervously, Colton looked at his mom and continued, it's okay, mommy. She's okay. God adopted her. Sonia slid off the couch and knelt down in front of her son so she could look him in the eyes. And she said, don't you mean that Jesus adopted her? And he said, no, Mommy, his daddy did. Sonia's eyes lit up. And then she asked a question to kind of see if he was making things up. She said, what was her name? What was a little girl's name? To which he replied, she doesn't have a name. You guys didn't name her. 
which was exactly true. As you can imagine, the parents were stunned. There is no way that Colton could have known this. So there was this kind of this pause. Well, she processed this, and he began to move to go outside to play, and then he stopped, and he turned around, and he said one more thing. She said, yeah. She said she can't wait for you and Daddy to get to heaven. If you want to read a story about some of that, right here, Heaven is for Real. It's a really, really good book. Um, Not only is heaven an opportunity for us to be reunited with our loved one, is there an opportunity to be reunited with us? It's almost like they're cheering us on to the finish line, giving us encouragement to keep going. Keep going. There is something great in store for you. I think it adds a little bit of weight to the scripture that we see here in Hebrews 12. Would you guys read it with me? Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life and faith, let us strip off everything, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. Just by keeping our eyes on Jesus. When I was younger, I ran a race called the Tough Mudder. Uh, It's about a 15-mile race through the desert, up and down the mountains. And in the midst of it, there's about 30 obstacles, things like you you have to swim through an ice pool, you have to climb through mud pits. Uh, One of the last obstacles is they have these little uh, electrical wires that hang down, and you have to run through them while you're getting shocked. I know, it's it's a very masochistic type of thing, but um, uh, it's, it's really difficult. But... They have this really cool thing. So at the end, uh, the kind of the, it loops around. And so the people that finish are encouraged to come back and kind of spread themselves out along half mile of the finish line. And then there's other people there that are cheering them. And when you just can't keep going, they start encouraging you. Come on, you can do it. You're almost there. Finish line is just over the hill. Come on. And it kind of gives you that extra little bit that you need to keep going when things, when you just kind of want to quit. And I like to think that this is, the cloud of witnesses that we have, right? Not only do we have people in this world encouraging us, but we have those who have gone before up there just saying, come on, you can do it. I know it's hard. It's hard, but you just wait. There is such a reward at the end of this. Just keep going. And so my encouragement for you on this All Saints Sunday as we deal with grief, and saying goodbye, the most difficult thing we do is to remember the promises of what that goodbye means for those who have gone before and to remember that they are encouraging us onward to keep going, to continue to run the race until we too will receive that ward, until we will be reunited with them in a place with no more tears or pain or goodbyes. Amen? You join me in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Gracious Lord, I pray that you would help us to finish well this race called life. Remembering we are surrounded and encouraged by a great cloud of witnesses and loved ones who have already gone before us. Help us to keep our eyes on you and remember the beautiful place that you have prepared for us and for those who have gone before us. May we look forward to our reunion with them, the reunion that you have promised us in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.